Great Scenes from Great Plays, with your host, Walter Hamden, and starring tonight, Miss Celeste Holm and Mr. Walter Abel in Dark Victory. Each week at this same hour, the Episcopal families of your own community and the Episcopal Actors Guild invite you to share the dramatic inspiration of great scenes from great plays as transcribed by famous artists of stage, screen, and radio. And now, here is your host, the distinguished actor-manager, Mr. Walter Hamden. Thank you, and good evening. Our play tonight is not one of those tales which are briefly told, enjoyed, and soon forgotten, but a story so deeply appealing that it could be told a hundred times, and with each telling bring new pleasure. It is George Brewer, Jr. and Bertram Block's Dark Victory, and I am privileged to present as our stars tonight Academy Award winner Celeste Holm and the ever-popular star of stage and screen Walter Abel. Thank you, Mr. Hamden. I'm very happy to be here to play the role of Dr. Frederick Steele, and I'm happier still to have as Judith Traherne, my patient in the story, Celeste Holm. A lovely star, and a talented star, if I may say so. Thank you, Walter. Judith Traherne is a wonderful individual. Under her somewhat misleading manner, I think there beats a heart that every woman will understand. I like her so much that sometimes I forget she isn't real. Oh, but she is, Celeste, as we're about to learn. So let us go together through the open door of our imaginations into dark victory. We're in a hotel room. The early morning sun shines through the windows on fine furnishings and on a man's expensive leather bags in the process of being packed. Outside, the traffic of New York City roars down the avenue, but inside, the two men arguing hear only each other's quiet voices. And I realized last night I was licked, Fred. There are cases beyond the scope of a general practitioner, and this is one of them. So I... Thought of Dr. Frederick Steele, the best brain surgeon in the city, and I came to you. Thanks, Parson. You flatter me. But anyway, it's too late. I closed my office two days ago, and my train for Vermont leaves this afternoon. But this is a matter of life and death. I tell you, she's desperately ill. Think, Fred. A girl 27 years old, beautiful, rich, everything to live for, and she'll die unless she gets help. Help from you. What's a vacation compared with that? I'm not taking a vacation. I'm packing up everything I own, clearing out for good. You don't mean you're retiring at 35. Of course not. I'm going to be a country doctor. Parsons, among my old friends and neighbors, human beings I know and can keep on knowing, even when they're well and their case is closed. That's the kind of doctoring I want. Well, you can at least give me a diagnosis, can't you? Well, if I can diagnose from the facts you give me here and now. Very well. The girl's Judith Trahern. She's the daughter of Robert Traherne, the late wireman. I don't want her pedigree. I want her symptoms. Five months ago, she had a queer kind of accident. She was riding cross-country with a chap she knows. They were making for an open gate. She was on his right, and as they came near the gate, he kept well over to the left to give her room. But instead of riding through the opening, she went head-on for the fence, as though she hadn't seen it. What's that? She held her horse straight for that fence about six feet from the opening. Naturally, the animal shied and threw her. I saw her about an hour after. She'd ridden home, had breakfast, and seemed quite all right. But then she had a fainting spell. Did she actually faint, or was she just very dizzy? I couldn't make out. My first guess was her heart. But I think now she injured her head in some obscure way. What made you think so? She developed headaches after that, and they've been growing steadily worse. Fred, I'm desperate. I... 
You make it so tough to refuse, Parsons. Then don't refuse. Will you promise to bring me back in time to catch my train this afternoon? Yes, I promise. All right, then come on. I'll go talk to your Judith Trahan. How do you do, Miss Trahan? Hello, Doctor. Oh, how did you get those burns on your fingers? What burn? It doesn't matter. Sit down, Miss Trahan. How nice of you to ask me, Dr. Steele, in my own living room. Or is it your office now? <laughs> Hardly resembles an office, does it? Except for the books. Do you read all those books? Not much. <laughs> that is, not lately. Why, have your eyes been bothering you? No. If you don't mind, we won't talk about my health that bores me. Parsons insists there's something wrong with me. He's always bringing in new doctors. There isn't anything wrong with me, and I don't like doctors. Uh-huh. You're 27 years old, Miss Trahan. Yes, and I'm an only child. I weigh 125 pounds. I've had mumps, measles, and whooping cough all at the proper ages. My father drank himself to death, and my mother lives in Paris. If you're interested, we dislike each other cordially. Uh, so you live alone? Yes, but in plush surroundings. As well as uh, lonely? Lonely? <laughs> don't kid yourself, doctor. I have a marvelous time. All the pleasures of the idle rich. And I like them. Anyway, that's my racket. What's yours? Mine? High-pressure surgery. Park Avenue clientele. About ten days off each summer. Sounds awful. It is. It's a dreary round to which I've been caught up as you've been caught in yours. But I'm quitting, Mr. Hearn. I'm getting out. Where to? A little town in northern Vermont. I'm going to be a country doctor there. I thought you were tops in your line and made loads of money. The order of my life was still upset. Order? <laughs> That's old-fashioned nonsense. Well, you might take a look someday at the universe around you. You'll find it full of hidden mystery and incredible vitality, balanced and ordered in all its parts. You have only to look, and you'll see. I intend to, though not quite that way. I want to see the whole show, Doctor. To try everything once while I'm young. Get all the excitement that's going. Have every sensation, every experience there is. Admiration and, and gaiety and music and dancing and the world at my feet. Oh, dear. What's the matter? I haven't done this in years. Talked on like that. You made me, you led me on, and now I... Now you have a headache. No. Yes, and the light hurts your eyes. It does not. Why did you fall, Miss Trahan? The horse threw me, Dr. Steele. But why? Was it because you couldn't see the gate you were headed for? No, no, it's not true. But you were afraid and you didn't tell Dr. Parsons. And you never told him about your eyes. My eyes are fine. Are they? And what about that strange, dull feeling in your right arm? Oh. That's how you got the burns on your hand, Miss Trahan, from a cigarette. And you never even felt it because your tactile nerves are paralyzed. Don't. I've got to. Your memory's all shot to pieces, too, isn't it? No. Stop fighting. I won't let you talk. What did you do yesterday? Quickly. Well, I played bridge in the afternoon. I, I went to the theater. The, the other evening. way around, wasn't it? No, and of course. I. No, wait, I. I How'd you come out at bridge in the evening? Well, I don't know. I play so often. You I... lost, didn't you? Yes, I guess so. Rotten luck I've been having. No, Miss Trahan. Lately, you've been forgetting what cards are out and what's been bid. All right. All right, that's true. Everything's true. But I can't help it, can I? But perhaps I can help it. That's why I'm here. Now, will you let me try? <laughs> Well, Parsons, I've diagnosed the case for you, and... And? A brain tumor. Glioma. Beyond any doubt. In the temporal and parietal lobes. I've got to operate. Will it cure her? Temporarily. But if the x-rays show that the tumor is diffused, and I think it is, she'll get a recurrence. Mm. How long? Ten months to a year. She'll probably never know until the last. She'll just suddenly, someday, go blind for a minute. Blind? It won't last, but that's the signal. Afterward, there'll be not more than a few hours, and then sleep. Will you tell her? Well, I can't give her the blunt truth. But I've got to tell her something. After I've seen the x-rays, I'll have a talk with her. Miss Trahan, this may be something of a shock to you, but it's only the idea that's hard to accept and not the thing itself. If it's to be a punch, Doctor, I'm ready for it. That's not shadow box. You see, according to the X-ray, something's gone wrong in that incredible labyrinth of wires. The brain. The brain? Now, don't be alarmed. It's like any other part of the body. It gets out of kilter sometimes, and 
It has to be adjusted. Adjusted? An operation. Oh, no, I don't believe that. It's absurd, and I won't have it. It must be pretty serious. It is very serious. It's going to take our combined efforts to beat it, Mr. Hearn. I'll need all the help you can give me, all the faith, all the trust. How, how long would I have to stay in the hospital? Oh, about six weeks. And then I could lead a normal life again, Doctor? I, I'd be completely cured? I think I can guarantee that you'll make a complete surgical recovery. A complete surgical recovery? What's that mean? Well, it means you'll get well. Any more worries? I just wanted to be sure I knew the truth and that you weren't keeping anything back from me. All right, Dr. Steele. I trust you. <laughs> It's wonderful to see you back in your old form. Thanks. To what do I owe this great honor? Oh, stop it. Get down off that horse and I'll tell you. <laughs> tell me this way. It's safer. Nonsense. Judith, every time I see you, must you throw up to me what I am with other people? You know it's different with you. You're the only person in the world I respect. The only completely honest person I've ever met. I've met one myself. Ah, the brilliant brain surgeon. I'm sorry. Don't be angry. I don't think I can be today. It's spring, and, and I've been riding for the first time since my operation. I never felt better in my life, and I'm free, Alden, free. I'll never have to be afraid again. What? Not even of you. Now, what did you want to see me for? Oh, nothing much. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't sulk. If you've been waiting at my house, you must have some reason. Well, the fact is my publisher's descending on me this evening for a conference. He doesn't like my new book. <laughs> well, I still don't see what I've got to do with that, Alden. Hmm? Oh, well, I mean, he'll be in a frightful mood, you see, so I thought of a little dinner, very gay, very chic, with a few of my better friends. Tonight? Yes. Will you come, Judith? Please. I can't, really, Alden. I'm, I'm having an important guest of my own for dinner. A very important guest. Let me look at you, Judith. You look splendid. Do I? Completely fit. No headaches? None at all. Patient dismissed. Thank you. It's nice to be dismissed. So you're really starting off to be an old-fashioned country doctor. Oh, hideously old-fashioned. In Vermont. Way back in the hills of Vermont. Will you get down here again occasionally? Oh, not often. I expect they'll keep me pretty busy. I expect so. And you'll love it. In time, you'll forget us here. No, I... Judith, remember this. I'll come to you whenever you call me. Whenever I... But why should I call you, Fred? Well, no reason, but if you did, I'd come. But I've interfered with your life enough already, haven't I? You, you're three months late going to Vermont because of me. Who told you that? Dr. Parsons. I know you gave up your plans to save my life, Fred, and I can't find words to thank you for Just it. Just seeing you as you stand there repays me a thousand times for anything I've done. Fred... I'd like to believe that. Don't you? Judith, I once asked for your complete trust. Now I know that's not enough, Judith, anymore. I want your love, too, Judith. I, oh, I, Fred. If I shouldn't have said it, forgive me. But I wanted you to say it for so long. I've hoped and prayed you'd say it, because I love you, Fred. Judith, this is the first time I've ever asked. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to... You don't even know you can kiss me if you want to. Judith! Oh, darling. How do you take your coffee in the morning? <clears throat> Black. Strong. With no sugar. Revolt. Horrible. Like apple pie for breakfast. They have that in Vermont, don't they, Fred? They used to. Oh, Fred, can I have a flower garden? Oh. Can I? And, and, and babies. Lots of... Fred. What's the matter? Don't you want children? Yes, I... I... Then, then there's something wrong, isn't there? Something about the future. Judith. You, you never said I'd recover completely, did you? You said I'd make a complete surgical recovery. Don't, darling. And just a few minutes ago, you said you'd come back whenever I called you. You meant if I was sick. 
You meant I'm going to be sick again. But you didn't want me to know. Fred. Fred, you've got to tell me. I'd hoped with all my soul this wouldn't happen, but it has, so we'll face it. Together, Judith. Hold on to my hand, dear, and listen. As far as surgery goes, you're cured. Absolutely. That's the truth. But there are some things that surgery can't do. Oh, no. You mean this horrible thing's coming back? And it's another op... No. No, it doesn't, does it? It means another operation wouldn't do any good. Doesn't it, Fred? Tell me the truth. That's right, Judith. How will it happen? As quietly as going to sleep. There'll be a moment when you won't be able to... to see as usual. That's all. You mean I'll go blind? Just for a moment. Then you'll be perfectly all right again. But after a few hours, two or three, you... you'll go to sleep. I see. How much time have I before... Six months. Possibly ten. Oh, how nice. How terribly merciful. And you've known this all along from the very first. Yes. And you're still offering to marry me and take me to Vermont with you. <laughs> it's very chivalrous of you, Fred. So like you. Judith. No, I have nothing. Not you. Not Vermont. Not the flower garden. You're marrying me, Judith. You're coming with me. Thanks just the same, Fred, but I'm staying. Right here among my friends where I can cram every minute I have left for the only kind of living I know. Please go, Fred. And don't ever come back. Hello, my sweet... Just dropped in to say congratulations on the loving cup. Oh, that. Take it if you want it, Alden. I don't. After almost killing your horse and your lovely self to get it. I wanted to win, that's all. Now I have. Would you mind leaving my dressing room, Alden? I'd like to change. What's the hurry? You're not going anywhere except home, that is. Now that all your friends but me have turned against you. They haven't. Oh, come, come, my dear. You used to be honest. All right, they have. So what? Nothing. I just thought you might be lonely, even if it's your own fault. Get out of here, Alden. The way you've been acting the past three months. Get out. But I want to stay. Now look, Alden. No, you look. In the mirror there on the wall. See yourself as you are now, darling Judith, because you don't realize how you've changed. <laughs> you ought to be glad there's a man who still wants you. But not you, Alden. You don't want me, really. You don't know the truth about me. You don't know that in a couple of months I'm going to die. You what? It's true, Alden. Dr. Steele knows. Ask him. He'll tell you my old illness is coming back, and this time it can't be cured. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Judith. Really sorry. I... So that's why you've been kicking over all the traces. Yes. But I'm very grateful to you for pointing it out to me. Because I was going to die a coward and a cheat. And suddenly I find I don't want to. I'd rather be brave for a change. And if it isn't too late, and I don't think it is somehow, I'm going to try to be brave. Dr. Fred? Yes. Hello, Miss Jenny. I'm home. And about time, too. It's past nine o'clock. I'll get you some supper. No, please. I had supper before I got here. Did you, Frederick? Now, look, Miss Jenny, I'm not in the second grade any longer, remember? <laughs> so I can't bully you anymore. Is mm. that it? All right. But I do wish... Wait! I thought I heard footsteps outside. No, if there were, the bell would ring. You're just haunted, Dr. Fred. Nonsense. You think any medical man believes in ghosts? Well, you may not believe in them, but there's one in your life, and it's made you unhappy ever since you've been here. No. No, you can't fool me any more than you could about that supper you said you've just had, and I'm going to warm you up some supper right this minute. But, Miss Jenny, come in. Come in. The door's open. <coughs> Judith! Judith, you've come. Yes, Fred. I've come. I've come because... No, no, steady, darling. Don't try to talk now. You're tired. Here, let me take your suitcase and... No, wait. Please, before anything. I have to tell you this, Fred. I did what I said I would. 
I've lived up to every silly boast I made three months ago. But you're here. I couldn't die without you thinking, of, with you thinking of me like that. I, I had to show you at least that, at the end, I've learned something, Fred. I won't ask much of you now, except to be here, where your strength will help me face things. Judith, darling, I'll never let you go again. <laughs> a man and a dying girl have met to love. Fred, it's too late. It's not, it's not, not while we're together. For a moment? For always. Darling, a moment isn't forever. The shadow's on my life, and I don't want it to fall on yours. My darling, listen. Between now and now, there's been birth and the passing of life, sunset and dawn, and your shadow's mine, and your victory over it, that's mine too. But others, what will they think, Miss Jenny? She won't know, Judith. We'll never tell her. Then... Then I'm not afraid of the future. Not with you, Fred. Let it come. Hello? What? Montreal calling Dr. Steele, but he isn't here. I can't tell you where to reach him. I think he's on his way home. So can I take a message? I'm Mrs. Steele. Yes, I'll tell him. Dr. Platt in Montreal, and it's an emergency operation. Yes, he'll have to take the train tonight. I understand. Oh, please don't worry. He'll be on that train if he's needed. You're welcome. Goodbye. Oh, dear. Now, don't you worry, Mrs. Fred. If he goes, he'll be back soon. I, I can't help grudging every second he's away. I better look and see if he's coming. Any sign of him yet? There's no car on the road as far as I can see. It's going to snow, isn't it? What? Sun's gone in. It's getting dark. I don't know what you're talking about, Mrs. Fred. The sun's out as bright as ever. No, Angel, can't you see? It's, it's clouding up faster and faster, growing dimmer by the minute. Why, oh, it's all dark. Completely. <gasps> Why, Mrs. Fred. Child, what is it you... Nothing. Things went dark for a minute, as if I were going to faint. But I feel better now. I can see perfectly well again, Miss Jenny. And I'll prove it. There's Fred's car coming down the road now. That's fine. You can tell Dr. Fred. I can tell him nothing but that telephone message. And don't you. Or he mightn't go. And it's his work. And he's got to. But he... And everything else can wait. Judith, where are you? Upstairs, Fred. I'll bring down your bags when I come. All right, dear, thanks. It's almost time. I know. Now, Miss Jenny, here's a list of phone numbers in case you should have to call me. All right, Frederick. If anything goes wrong of any kind, you're to phone me immediately. You can reach me at any one of those numbers. And meanwhile, take care of Judith. You don't have to tell me. Here are your things, Fred. Oh, thanks, darling. i better get started then, I suppose. Goodbye, Miss Jenny. Goodbye, Dr. Fred, and good luck. I'll be back with you soon. Come on, Judith, walk to the car with me. Of course. It's not a long walk, is it? Compared with some we've taken through these hills? No. Judith, darling, if anything, if anything happened... Oh, Judith! Shh, dearest, nothing's going to happen. Go with a quiet mind, I Fred. can't. I thought I could, but I can't. I'll call Dr. Platt and tell him I'm Fred, not... Fred, some... look at me. We have our love, and we're complete. Nothing can hurt us now, no matter what. See, what we've had can never be wiped out. And that's our victory. Our victory over the dark. It's a real one, darling, because we're not afraid. Not you and I. Not afraid ever, are we? No. No, we're not afraid. Thanks, Judith. I can go now. And not look back. And not look back, my dearest. Hold me a minute. Close. Forever is now. Isn't it, Fred? Yes. Like this forever. I'm off, darling. Goodbye for a little while. For a little while, Fred. For a little while. Goodbye, Fred. Yes, 
Walter Hamden, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be back in a moment to tell you about next week's play. But first, an important message of interest to you. Most of us know very well from the experiences of our own lives the harm that can be done to us and to those around us by fear. We know what damage fear can do to our minds and bodies. We know how fear can disrupt family harmony and community relations as well as personal happiness. And we know, too, that fear is at the bottom of much of the discord that exists today among nations. In tonight's powerful play, the heroine, Judith Traherne, had to live with a very great fear. The darkness of her uncertainty was the darkness of death itself, for she knew that her days on earth were numbered. Yet great and destructive as that fear was, she was finally able to conquer it by putting in its place an even greater love. The great lesson dramatized in tonight's play is that love can always conquer fear, a principle demonstrated by millions of sincere Christians throughout the world who know how the love of God brings them greater peace and security, helps them to rise above the myriad fears and uncertainties of our modern world. That's why the Christian church is doing so much to relieve the tensions born of fear, tensions between nations as well as individuals. That's why so many are discovering how much more complete and secure their lives are when they make the teachings of the church the foundation of their entire existence. Perhaps you will be able to find the spiritual help you need in the Episcopal Church. You are always welcome at your nearest Episcopal Church, and its clergyman is always ready and eager to give you whatever help you may require. To help you know something about the Episcopal Church and how it offers you a faith with which to find security and happiness in these difficult times, we have prepared an informative booklet called Finding Your Way. It will be sent to you promptly if you will simply write your name and address on a postcard and mail it to the station to which you are listening. I would like to thank you, Celeste Holm and Walter Abel, for a magnificent performance. Next week, friends, we shall present an old favorite, Paul Osborne's delightful comedy drama, On Borrowed Time, the amusing and touching story of a very old grandfather and his very young grandson, and a mysterious gentleman trapped in an apple tree. Here to play the role of that victim of strange circumstances will be one of the great stars of stage and screen, Mr. Boris Karloff. I hope you'll join us. Celeste Holm appeared tonight through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of Apartment for Peggy. And now an invitation from the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church in your community cordially invites you to attend services this Sunday morning. If you are not familiar with the location of your nearest Episcopal Church or of the hours of service, you'll find both listed in your local newspaper or church directory. Your rector will be happy to have you join the Episcopal family. You'll find